Gary Black is a structural engineer, professor of architecture at the University of California at Berkeley, and the president of Integrated Structures. Black began his career working for the architect Christopher Alexander, who is most well known for his book, A Pattern Language. Early on, Black was motivated to integrate the practices of engineering, architecture, and construction. While working on his Master of Architecture degree, he saw that Chris Alexander was also on the same path of integrating these three disciplines, and Black wanted to join Alexander at his company, the Center for Environmental Structure. In this talk, I'm going to discuss three of the structural innovations that Black has developed throughout his career, one in timber, one in concrete, and one in steel and the design, construction, and regulatory challenges that brought each one to fruition. Shortly after joining Alexander's company in 1982, CES was awarded their largest project, the design, engineering, and construction of over 30 buildings as part of a new joint high school and college in Japan called the Aishin School. It was decided early on that timber would be a featured structural material, especially in the gymnasium building. Designing the trusses in the gymnasium was an iterative design process involving over 30 iterations of the truss structure. This was achieved using physical models in conjunction with early finite element analysis. Black, having attended UC Berkeley, was in touch with Dr. Ed Wilson, the creator of the SAP software, and was able to obtain a floppy disk with the first commercial of SAP, SAP80. CES bought a small Radio Shack computer to perform the modeling of all the buildings on the project. Now, because of the way that the truss design process was leading, the trusses were being sized with members that did not lie on the flat plane. For example, an 8x12 top cord connected to 4x4 web members, and thus these could not be easily connected with a steel plate. The truss members needed to be connected on the center line, so Black envisioned a type of internal tension connection that would allow them to use these sections of differing widths. The connection that Black designed looks like this. It is more well-known now, but at the time, around 1982, this was something that Black had not seen before. Because there was no testing available on this specific connection, Black pursued a rational failure analysis of the joint. Black predicted that there would be six total failure modes with four principal failure modes, three of them brittle and one ductile failure. Because he did not have testing data available, he used large factors of safety in designing for the ductile failure mode. This meant that, in the joints, they would be drilling 20-inch deep boreholes into the ingrain of large timbers, something that the Japanese building inspectors were not in love with. Now, it's worth mentioning that 10 years later, Black was able to perform a parametric study on this connection, testing 145 specimens to validate the failure analysis he did during the design of the Aishin school, and he found that his assumptions were mostly correct. The connection was used throughout the gymnasium, but this was a difficult-to-construct joint, the person who made this possible was their site supervisor and lead carpenter, a 70-year-old master carpenter named Mr. Sumiyoshi. Mr. Sumiyoshi aligned philosophically with the design team and the integrated design and construction vision they were trying to execute on the school. The design and the construction of the school were taking place simultaneously, and CES was responsible for all of it. As part of the approval for the design and engineering of the project, Black had to give a presentation to an organization that was basically the government's Ministry of Construction. As he describes it, he was a 32-year-old kid going into a room with these 12 structural engineering professors sitting across from him, grilling him for almost an hour on every design decision he'd made, including all of his connections. After questioning him for 45 minutes and being generally satisfied with his responses, the head professor on the committee asks him, Mr. Black, on the cross braces in the gymnasium, the braces are 10 by 10 members and, where they cross, you have put a notch in each of them to form a lapped joint. I am wondering if there is an eccentricity that could cause the compression member to buckle. Now when you cut a notch into the timber, you will obviously create a large eccentricity. But if you just cover the joint with a standard 6mm steel plate, you also create an eccentricity, but this time in the other direction, because of the steel's stiffness relative to the timber. Black told him, yes, you would think so, but on the steel strap that crosses the outside of the joint, I did a transform section and sized the steel strap to remove the eccentricity. Because of this, it's like the notch isn't even there. The professor was so impressed with his diligence and thoughtfulness with such a common and simple detail that he threw his pencil across the table and said, I think we're done questioning Mr. Black. This is what the gymnasium looked like right after it was built. And this is what it looks like today. 
It's worth noting that this building was the largest timber building built in Japan since World War II at the time it was built. Black and Alexander had been exploring the use of curved truss members in the Aishin project. At the time, they were making them from glue lamb, which was expensive. Black told Alexander that if they were going to continue developing these curved trusses, they should really look at making them from concrete. Shortly after the completion of the school in Japan, around 1986-1987, CES was awarded the job of designing and building a new homeless shelter in San Jose, the Julian Street Inn. It was to be a 50-bed, 1,600-square-meter facility. Black fought to make this project where CES explored making curved tracery trusses out of concrete. The client wanted the eating hall, in particular, to be a place with a strong feeling that elevated the clients of Julian Street Inn. However, because the budget was limited, Black suggested that, instead of investing in finishes, they should reallocate a larger portion of the budget to the structure and use the structure to define the architectural space. The first design studies of the eating hall focused on the relationship between the space in the hall and how it was shaped by the bottom cord. They tried 14 different sketches, three of which are shown here. The tripartite design with a large central arch and two smaller ones eventually emerged from this process. The client liked that it divided the hall into different but related spaces, with lower more private spaces towards the walls and windows, where new people could feel more comfortable. This truss was a challenge to design. Dozens of design iterations had to be performed to create a structure that was both beautiful and efficient. But, because this was concrete, what parts were going to be pin connections and which parts were going to be fixed connections? Black developed a way of detailing the members that would allow him to control some of the fixity of the connection. Pin connections were simulated by using small cross sections with centrally located single bar reinforcement. As the truss was loaded with its dead load, Local cracking would occur at these skinny sections, allowing them a small degree of rotational freedom to prevent them from attracting moment under further load. Because this kind of a truss design was so new, Black consulted further with Dr. Ed Wilson at UC Berkeley on the design. Dr. Wilson suggested that creep could be significant in this truss. If the creep caused a spreading of the supports to the point that they pressed against the outer walls, the bottom cord could begin behaving as an arch causing compression in the bottom cord, which could lead to lateral buckling. To avoid this, Black mounted the trusses on a generous Teflon plate, ensuring a roller connection at each end of the wall to keep the bottom in tension. To construct these trusses, it would be easiest and most economical to cast them on a flat bed and then lift them into place, but they were not reinforced to handle these out-of-plane loads. Instead of trying to pour concrete into the top of the truss formwork, where it would be difficult to get the consolidation within all those small web members, it was decided that the best way to place the concrete would be pneumatically placing it using gunite. Gunite is similar to shotcrete, except instead of blowing ready-mix concrete, gunite blows dry concrete mix and water separately and then mixes them in the nozzle, allowing for the pneumatic placement of low-slump concrete mixes and therefore higher-strength concrete mixes with near-perfect consolidation. The formwork was built on the ground, mounted into place, and two trusses were shot at a time through open-faced forms. Here's what the trusses look like in their final installed state. Now, ten years later, Black left Alexander's Center for Environmental Structure to establish his own company, Integrated Structures. Integrated Structures has a small, tight-knit team of people largely built from students that Black has mentored over the years. It is a place where Black can research new building techniques and continue building truly unique projects, often affordably, because of his mind to constant innovation. Around this time, Black had an idea of how to build these concrete trusses in a way that could be done more economically by casting them on the flat slab. In the late 90s, Integrated Structures was asked to perform engineering design and construction management on a new church in Kansas called St. Andrew's Christian Church. The pastor of the church was on the building committee and had seen some of Black's previous work. She told him that, I would be very happy if we could have some of those trusses, just like you did in San Jose. The trusses at St. Andrew's were cast in a flat slab then picked at two points, lifted into place. Except where in San Jose, the trusses had a span of 30 feet. The St. Andrew's trusses spanned 70 to 80 feet. These kinds of spans were possible in Kansas, where it is a low seismic zone. For concrete trusses in high seismic zones such as San Jose, the accelerations pose a risk of creating large out-of-plane forces during an event because of the massive dead load of the truss. 
As such, they require bracing along the span to reduce those forces. Here are some of the pictures of the trusses at St. Andrews. Black told me he was particularly proud of the inclusion of a structural angel at the top of the truss. Black's company Integrated Structures has attracted many long-term clients, one of them being a developer who owns a building in Berkeley named the Tioga Building. The Tioga Building was built in 1955 using the lift slab technique, where slabs are cast all together on the ground level, then lifted sequentially into place to sit on preset columns. While many buildings have been built using the lift slab technique, a horrible accident in 1987 in Connecticut, which killed 28 people, largely put an end to its use. The Tioga building had not been seismically upgraded, and it suffered a public image problem that made it difficult to lease to large tenants. Black came up with the idea of tree branches supporting the building from the outside. The appeal was by reinforcing the exterior of this building. They could re reduce global torsion by bringing the center of rigidity closer to the center of mass. Additionally, this reinforcement scheme would make a large and obvious statement to the public that it has been thoughtfully and thoroughly upgraded, thereby improving its public image. Black and his company took the idea to the building department at Berkeley. They took one look at this and said, uh, yeah, you guys are going to need to do full-scale load tests to make sure this works if you want to do this. This was obviously not going to be feasible for this kind of a project. Black brought two of his seismic engineering colleagues at UC Berkeley into his office to discuss whether the tree branches could be built as an eccentrically braced frame. The consensus was that it could be done if it could be guaranteed that the shear could be completely isolated into the shear link. Commonly in EBF frames, we see the shear link as a horizontal element between two steel beams. However, because this is going to be a retrofit of a concrete building, it made more sense to install a vertical shear link on top of the lift slab. This would allow the retrofit to proceed without any major demolition. Transferring shear forces through the building was done by embedding a steel plate onto the top of each slab as a drag strut, and a T-section into the bottom of each slab as a collector for the branches. These were bolted together through the concrete to form a composite section, and welded to the HSS columns to collect the forces on the perimeter of the building. During an event, the reaction forces from the tree branch tops converge at the bottom as two force components and a moment force. The connection has to resolve these three principal forces, the lateral force F1, the vertical force F3, and the applied moment. All vertical forces from the moment and F3 are resisted by the two outer bolts when in the tension cycle. In the compression cycle, F3 is resisted by direct bearing. F1, the lateral force, is isolated by the connection of the branch at the slab by a Teflon pad that allows the branch base to slide through slotted bolt holes. This allows the full force of F1 to be transferred into the shear link, which is isolated by a gap all the way around the base of the branch. When the branch moves side to side, it engages the shear link at the top directly, and this is the way that the shear link can be fully isolated. However, the shear link itself creates an eccentricity, whose vertical components need to be resolved by the two inner bolts, which are welded directly to the shear plates in the link. I asked Mr. Black about the client's interest in this more involved iterative design process. As a developer, did he have any resistance to it? It was quite the opposite. The upgrades to the Tioga building were obvious to all in the neighborhood, so it completely reversed the deleterious public image the building had. Black's client called him afterwards to tell him that this project was the single biggest moneymaker of any project he'd ever done because he had now been able to lease the building to a major tenant. Further, the Berkeley Building Department went out of their way to call Black to tell him that it's now probably the safest building in Berkeley. Black is going to be presenting this technique for designing EBFs at the 2019 Architectural and Civil Engineering Conference in Singapore, as it creates an opportunity for EBF bracing to have a much wider range of architectural form beyond the standard chevron brace, including even curved and other non-conforming sections, so long as they are designed to remain linear elastic and the shear link remains isolated. To conclude this presentation, I want to reiterate what I think is the greatest factor in what allowed these innovations to come into existence. It is Black's determination that architecture, engineering, and construction should not be separate activities. They should be all one unfolding process. At Innovative Structures, Mr. Black and his business partner of 20 years, Cullen Berta, have continued to innovate, most recently with a new kind of thermal mass wall that allows even industrial buildings with high thermal loads to become net zero buildings. 
Mr. Black relayed a story to me in our conversations together. He told me that he was discussing this idea of integrating architecture, engineering, and construction with Dr. David Billington, the famed structural engineering professor at Princeton. Dr. Billington told him that the greatest buildings of the past were not created by someone trying to integrate these three disciplines, as you are trying to do. Rather, they exist as they do, because these roles had not yet been segregated. I think this is a true thing. If it has been only recently that our three disciplines have been segregated, what has changed to make this so? Going forward, I believe that innovation and structural engineering will not come from developing new or more automated technology. These things on their own do not require a whole lot of imagination to conceive of. Those tools will come but they need to be channeled into a human process of collaboration to create beautiful buildings. I believe that the innovation we seek will come from our ability to reintegrate or desegregate what we now regard as three separate disciplines. This is, I believe, where the beautiful buildings in our future will come from.